intense. I don't normally get that kind of welcome or introduction. Nobody says, here's the chaplain. That's not a thing. <laughs> uh, good morning, Crosswalk. You're looking good again. Looking good. Glad you're here. Uh, some of you may not have been here last week, so you don't know who I am and why I'm here. My name is Steve. Uh, I am uh, pretty new to Crosswalk, been here about a year, but uh, this is uh, the place I call home. And, uh, and I got the opportunity last week and this morning to, to come and have some conversation with you, and I'm, I'm happy for that. Uh, my normal nine to five, it goes beyond nine to five, unfortunately, but uh, my normal gig is I'm a, a hospital chaplain at Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital, and um, we can talk more about that later. But, uh, but I'm glad to be back with you this morning. Um, uh, it's good to be back here. Um, I've been doing the, the church ministry thing for close to 20 years now, and being in a place like this is, is pretty special because we, we really get to be real, and, and we don't have to put on false faces, and we don't have to avoid hard topics, and, uh, and so uh, if, if you were here last week, I gave you a lot of advance warning of, of what you're in for this week, and, and you showed up anyway. <laughs> Last week we talked about uh, anxiety, worry, physical illness, and I told you over and over we'd be talking about death this week. And um, you'd think that for a chaplain, death is something that I ought to be pretty comfortable talking about. But you know what? It's still awkward. It's awkward. There are a lot of other things that I would feel less awkward talking about this morning. I would t rather talk about, like, nose hair grooming for men than, than <laughs> death, you know? It's, <laughs> there's a lot of things out there. It, it's, it's, a, it's an awkward thing, even for me. The kind of awkward that I experienced in my very first year of being a chaplain, I was in a residency program, and I got a call to visit the room, an ICU room, but I wasn't told why I was going in there. And so I went in, and there's the patient, there's the family, and still being new, uh, you kind of miss some things, some things bigger than others. In this case, I missed a fairly big one, but they asked me to say a prayer, so I said a prayer, and it was a good one. It was a really good one for healing and health and vitality for the patient, and then I found out the patient was already dead. <laughs> True story. Awkward, right? They were good about it. The, the family was good. I didn't really pray for healing in those words, so it wasn't as bad as it may have sounded, but... Yeah, this stuff is, yeah, it's, it's not intuitive for us, and especially in our culture. We hate talking about death. We avoid talking about death. And, and so we get to spend some time, and I'm grateful that you showed up this morning, even though you knew what you were getting into. And um, we're, we're going to be talking about a few things that, that are, are from the book series, that we've been going through for the last several weeks. It's uh, a book called Unafraid by Adam Hamilton. And, um, and throughout the book and, and throughout the, the previous talks that, that Pete has given, he's, they've together put a lot of statistics in front of you. So my, my high goal in life is to be just like Pete. So I wanted to put them, some uh, statistics together for you. And I don't have a, a fancy PowerPoint for you, so I'm just going to rattle through a bunch of numbers that you're going to forget in a few minutes, and that's all good. Um, one of the interesting things about talking about death and, and life these days is that uh, in terms of life expectancy, a lot has changed. Even in the past 100, 200 years of human history, 
life expectancy has changed quite a lot. In 1900, life expectancy for white women was 49 years old. For white men, 47. For African American women, life expectancy was 34 years old. And for African American men, 33. 100 years later, in 2000, life expectancy for white women had gone from 49 to 80. And for white men, from 47 to 75. African American women more than doubled their life expectancy from 34 to 75. And for African American men, from 33 to 68. That's a lot of difference in, in 100 years' time. Those are huge jumps. And those jumps have, there's, there's a lot of complex reasons for that. Uh, for one thing, we came up with some really cool vaccines that, that helped prevent disease and uh, antibiotics and surgical techniques. Access to wealth changed a lot. Uh, laws that, re that help people workplace safety kinds of things, those things that are sometimes annoying, those are actually helpful sometimes. So we are living a lot longer. Uh, overall, life expectancy as of 2016, just a couple years ago, which is the latest year that we have data, uh, life expectancy in the U.S. right now is 78.6. 78.6. For women, you ladies get a little bit more out of life, 81.3, and men, 76.3. But in 2000, 16 years prior to that, uh, the overall life expectancy was 76.9. So even in less than 20 years, our life expectancy has increased by a year and a half. Pretty big differences. Um, and another interesting thing about life expectancy is the longer you live, the longer your life expectancy is supposed to be. If you make it to age 65 right now, your life expectancy gets up to 84. Pretty good. Some of you are wincing right now. <laughs> um, in, in, uh, in California, uh, our, our average life expectancy is actually a couple years older than the national average. Um, uh, as of 2016, women in uh, California lived to 83 and men to a little more than 78. And in Napa County, women live just under that, 82.9, and men, 78.1. And if you're just wondering if you want to live a long time, where you should do that living, California is a pretty good place. We rank number four in the nation for, for length of life. Uh, if you want to get longer, you're, you're going to have to suffer in Hawaii. Uh, they're number one. Uh, and if you want it over quickly, buy a plane ticket to Mississippi. <laughs> Hot tip for you there. All right. All right. Well, uh, in, even in, in terms of uh, the causes of death, in Napa County, we actually do pretty well here, uh, even in terms of the rest of the state. In terms of the leading causes of death, things like heart disease, cancer, suicide, accidents, Napa only ranks in the top 10 cities in the state in two categories, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, okay? Now, again, I've thrown a ton of numbers at you. That's fine. The, the next set of statistics that I'm, I'm going to go through, I've, I've studied this in academic journals, in my job as a chaplain. I pay attention to these things. So um, the next set of numbers is a little easier to, to, to figure out, okay? So for men who have had a cancer diagnosis at any age in life, eventual death rate, 100%. <laughs> Women, if you've had a diagnosis of kidney disease that requires hemodialysis, eventual death rate, 100%. For non-smokers, the eventual death rate is 100%. People who drink carrot juice smoothies, 
100%. Do you see the trend here? Teenagers that listen to Justin Bieber. <laughs> Eventual death rate is 100%. Here's a scary one. For white men in their late 40s who give talks at churches in Napa in the month of July, 100%. And uh, for, for all people who listen to those white men in their late 40s, yeah, you're in for it. Okay. We've got a, we've got a, a real trend. For all the really incredible scientific discoveries that have lengthened our lives, the, the long-term cure rate is zero. And, and this is where we even run into a problem with Adam Hamilton's book, right? The, the acronym that we've used over and over throughout this is uh, the acronym for fear. False expectations or false events appearing real. There's nothing false about this one. This is a real thing that we all are going to have to deal with. And uh, it's a little bit awkward to be honest with you. It's a little awkward. And death may be a topic that, that you're not unfamiliar with. Most of us have a lot of experience with it. Everybody here has had some experience with it. Some a little more recently than others. Some have had what seems like a very unfair number of experiences with it. But we all know about death. We all die. And that is not a big revelation. And, and even if we've seen it, we've seen the process, we've seen how it happens, the truth is we don't really know what it means. We only know it from one point of view, our own. We, the living, this is a weird one, we, the living, are the ones that talk about death. See, now I'm talking to you, and you all can hear me, I'm assuming. You can hear my words, you hear my tone of voice, you hear how fast I'm speaking, you, you, hear that going on, but you can't see my facial expressions. You can't see whether my eyes are open or closed. And, and there's a lot of vague kind of stuff going on right now. There's this sense of unknowing. I could be sticking my tongue out at you right now and making faces and, and you wouldn't know. And that's a little bit like death. Now, as a chaplain, I probably do have about as much experience with death as anybody here this morning. I've been present at hundreds of patients as they take their final breaths. And uh, if you extend that to, to the patients that I've visited in their last hours, it's probably up over a thousand. But even I have to admit that death is still a mystery. We know some things about it, but there's a lot that we still don't know. It's kind of like that verse in 1 Corinthians where, where the Apostle Paul tells us that we see things as in a mirror, but it's a dark mirror, and we, we can't really see things very clearly. And I realize this morning that talking about death is a little uncomfortable, just like having a conversation with somebody that's not facing you. And it's a little awkward, and it's a little heavy. And even if I try to sprinkle in some jokes and try and keep a, a light mood and an engaging tone with you, uh, it's hard stuff. So periodically, I, I want to just hit pause. So I'd invite you right now to close your eyes. Close your eyes for a moment. And let's just all take a few deep cleansing breaths. Big, deep, long breaths. Inhale in. Hold it. And then gently let it go. 
just do that a few times. Feel the fresh air around you. We are here. And here is beautiful. And we are beautiful. Now, right now, is beautiful. Enjoy the beauty. Continue breathing. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back into the room, come back into this space. All right. Nice to see you again. All right. One of the interesting things that, that I've observed about death kind of across the board is that um, even in our physical bodies, we have this resistance to death. It's kind of wired into us in every cell of our body. We want to stay alive. The human body wants to stay alive. Uh, even people that are in dark places of depression and maybe even suicidal, their bodies are still wanting to stay alive, right? That's hardwired into us. Um, this week, I had the unfortunate um, story of, of being with a 31-year-old cancer patient who, who was in a position where some of her parts of their body, they were shutting down. And the decision was made to, to transition her to what we call comfort care, where the, the focus of our treatment is no longer on trying to find a cure or, or treat the cancer, but let's let her go peacefully and, and make her comfortable and surround her with her family and just let her go. Unfortunately, in this case, because she's young and otherwise pretty healthy, even though certain parts of her body were shutting down, the rest of her body didn't get the memo. And the dying process actually took a few extra days compared to, to perhaps somebody in a different condition. And that's hard. But her body was trying to stay alive. And that made it hard. Uh, but we make these decisions without even knowing it. Earlier, we, we had you talk to each other about the decisions that you made this morning, okay? You may have made a decision whether to have coffee or tea this morning. You may have decided whether to have bacon and eggs at home or wait until you got here to really load up on the carbs, okay? You made decisions about whether to wear shoes or not, whether to wear a blue shirt, a black shirt, looks like you all wore shirts, so that's, that's good. Um, but you made a bunch of decisions. One of the decisions that you probably didn't make is whether to flip the switch for your heart. It just was beating, right? And you didn't make a decision to draw breath into your lungs. Your body made that for you. Our bodies want to stay alive. And, uh, and even, even with this new device that we have here, by the way, Dar, the, the language you used was a little uncomfortable for me. You said, if somebody becomes unresponsive, we have this cool new thing. And that made me a little nervous about the talk I'm giving to you. <laughs> um, people <laughs> become unresponsive around me a lot. So. Um, so far, I don't think we need the device yet, so that's good. Um, your body wants to stay alive. And in, in part because of that physical thing, we, we make the assumption automatically that, that of course we want to stay alive. That's our mindset. It's not just our physical body. Our mindset is to stay alive. And, um, and staying alive as long as possible is our default, right? It doesn't occur to us that that at some point, well, how long do I want to live? You know, that's not really a question we talk about because we're, we're just assuming that staying alive is part of, part of our job, right? 
And, and it's interesting because we, we employ certain metaphors and language in, in the way that we talk about death. We talk about, um, especially when we talk about fi physical diseases, we talk about fighting a lot. We, we fight cancer, you know? We're, we're in a battle against heart disease. Uh, we don't hear about it so much nowadays, but not too terribly long ago, there was a war on AIDS, right? Uh, we, we have these certain metaphors that we employ, and uh, I think those are valuable, and, and they're helpful at times, and sometimes not so much. Because ultimately, if we're fighting to win against a disease, do I need to revisit the, the, the death rates, ultimately? Sooner or later, we're all losers, right? And, uh, and, and, and to me, death is not losing. That's not helpful. Dying is not losing, and, and we'll get back to that in a, in a little bit. Um, even in terms of the way we treat certain kinds of diseases, some of the leading causes of death, things you're familiar with, heart disease, lung cancer, type 2 diabetes, suicide. These are in a category that, that we often hear uh, in terms of causes of death, the, the label we use is these are preventable causes. Almost as though if we stopped smoking, went on a diet, got therapy, we would live forever, right? We, <laughs> we prevented death, right? And, and we know that that's not true. So um, a more truthful way of saying all this is th that we're not, we're not preventing death. We're prolonging life. Okay, and, and that's a good thing. It's an exciting thing that we're able to, to do this. But, uh, but it does sort of get at something our culture struggles with. We like winners. And, and we celebrate winning. But sometimes we lose, and that's not a failure. Okay, other cultures are a little bit better at that. So since this has already become a little bit of a study in linguistics, um, I, I want to retake, I want to do a retake on, on the question, is anyone actually really afraid of death? Now, a lot of you would say, no, I'm not afraid to die. But, but I'm wondering if anybody is. Okay? A lot of people, including people of faith, are afraid of what happens after death. And a lot of people might fear dying the hours and days and weeks leading up to death. And I think more than anything, what we're really afraid of, even more than our own death, we're afraid of the people that we love dying. And we have to be honest about that too. And, uh, and, and I'm not here to convince you that dying is easy. It's, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's messy. And it's still a mystery. It's still a mystery for us. All I can say is what we've already said. Death exists. It's going to greet us all one day. And we may not be aware of when it's going to come. I can't tell you what it's going to be like for you when your day comes, and I can't tell you what it's going to be like for me. I can say that I've sat with enough people that I've gotten little glimpses here and there. And, and I've seen some of those mysterious moments at the end. And, and even when death comes, it, there's a very special presence of peace. I've been in our trauma room where we were working really hard. CPR, lots of noises and machines and, and a lot of chaos in the room. And, and when it's unsuccessful and, and we acknowledge that this person has died, there's a presence of peace that comes into that very room of chaos. And I happen to believe that peace is there 
because a God of love is there. But it's still a mystery. I've never died, so I don't know that experience. And, uh, and it, it's not something that, that I can say much about. I don't personally have a great fear of death, but what do I know? What do I know? Over the past few years, I have had probably a couple dozen conversations with, with people that have had what, what we term near-death experiences, where their heart has stopped. And, and these people describe what they experienced. They, they've seen the great light. And they may have heard some things. They may have had conversations with family or even God. And, and those are glimpses, too. But it's still more of a mystery than anything. So it's time to just push pause again. Close your eyes. Take in a few deep cleansing breaths once again. Feel the fresh air around you. You are here. We are here and we're together. And we have been given a gift of life. And life is beautiful. And we are beautiful. And this time is beautiful. Enjoy that. And now, as, as, as it comes to a point for you to be ready, go ahead and open your eyes. Come back to where we are. Nice to see you again. We're going to take another deep dive into some of this stuff in a minute. But I'm going to get a little salesy and practical with you for a minute, because this stuff's important too. Sometimes dying involves practicality. So I'm going to give you about a 90 second sales pitch for doing an advanced healthcare directive. Um, uh, I don't know if you all have advanced healthcare directives or some kind of a trust, but it's really important, folks. Um, we need to know, we in the medical community, when we get folks coming into the hospital and they're unconscious, not able to speak for themselves, and we have very lim limited information to go on, uh, we don't know what you want in terms of medical treatment. And you all have different answers for what kinds of medical treatment you want. So it's really important to have this simple legal document that helps us that designates a decision maker if you're unable to speak for yourself, that tells us what kind of treatment you want. Do you want CPR? If you're having a hard time breathing, do you want a ventilator to put down your, your throat? And if so, how long, right? There's a lot of things like that that are very practical. And uh, that part of the sales pitch is over, but the, the real point the real value, I think, of having an advanced health care directive is actually that it involves a conversation with the people in your life, the people that are closest to you. You're, you're helping them know how to help you. And in having those conversations, you're actually opening the door to talking about the big stuff of life, the kinds of values that you have, the kinds of... of uh, the way you would define quality of life, right? These are important conversations for all of us to have with the people in our lives. And because we're squeamish and awkward and don't like talking about this stuff, we avoid it. But I'm here to plead with you to do this, not just for the sake of the, the medical professionals that may have to treat you. Do it for the sake of yourself and your family so that you can open the door to those really good conversations, okay? 
All right. So now we, as followers of Jesus, we can talk a lot about death and dying and, and some of those practical things all day long. But we have a particular take on death and dying, right? And, um, and we'll get into this in just a moment, what that particular take is. It's, it's not a thorough, hard to understand theological treatise it's only going to take a few minutes for me to talk you through. But, um, but the reality of dying is ever before us, okay? And I want to not just say death is not failure. Death is a gift, okay? A few years ago, um, I had a conversation with a 30-year-old young woman who, uh, who was very tearful she and her wife had just been given the news that her cancer diagnosis was terminal. There were no more treatment options for her. She'd been in treatment for cancer for a little more than a year. And they had just found out that nothing left to do. Okay? And that was a hard conversation. But this, this was really a beautiful conversation because this 30-year-old, 30-year-old said, you know what, I'm really thankful for this cancer. I don't want to die, but I'm so thankful for cancer. Because in the past year, I've gotten to, to fix broken relationships and say I'm sorry. And I got to do things that I had been putting off doing until a later point in life. And, and the, the real kicker, she said, was I finally got to become the person I always wanted to be. Knowledge of, of her impending death was a gift to her. It's a scary gift, a gift that she probably didn't really want. But, but death and, and the reality of death before us, it does put things in perspective. It does help us to focus on the things that matter. In, in preparing a talk on death and dying, there's, there's so much. We could go on for another three hours, okay? When Pete gets home tonight, I'm kind of tempted to just calling him and saying, go ahead and take another couple weeks off because I have more to say about this, okay? There's a lot to say, and I don't need to say it all. But um, one, of the, one of the things that I found as I was kind of putting things together today was that uh, this quote from uh, a former Harvard professor, Richard Alpert. Some of you may know him by a different name now. He goes by Ram Das, And he has one of the most beautiful thoughts on death I've ever heard. And he's had a lot of experience working with death and dying. He's lived more than 20 years post-stroke. Very debilitating stroke, so he kind of knows the territory. He says, death does not have to be treated as an enemy for you to delight in life. I encourage you to make peace with death, to see it as the culminating adventure of this adventure called life. It is not an error. It is not a failure. Take this in. Death is taking off a tight shoe, which you have worn well. Breathe. It's okay. All right. Five-minute Bible study. Ready? Let's go. Um, one of the reasons that I don't have a particular fear of dying is not just because I'm, I'm a good Jesus-y guy, but I am a person of faith, and that makes a difference. And I do believe in a God that created life and, and all that exists, and, and the, that God created all of this stuff out of perfect love, okay? And because of Jesus in my life, 
I have come to believe that just like I spent some time with you on last week, I am not my body. Okay? We said this several times over last week. You are not your bodies. The, this body is the one that I experience the world through. I walk and talk and, and see and hear and smell things, and this is my vehicle. But I am more than my body. You are more than your bodies. Okay? So having faith in Jesus kind of brings things full circle. That, that we can spend all day long talking about death from a number of actually biblical points of view. But, but this physical body isn't all we've got. That's the real hope. That's why we don't fear death. Because this isn't really all there is to it. It's not the whole picture. If we go into the book of Genesis, we, we see this really interesting creation narrative. And uh, we've, got, we've got God making the heavens and the earth, the stars and the sun and, and the land and the oceans and the animals and the fish and the birds. And God makes man and woman out of perfect love. And, and out of perfect love places man and woman into a perfect place, this garden, this beautiful garden where they don't have to worry about what they're going to eat or drink, or how they're going to live. It's all right there for them. And all they have to do is not go to the tree over there. Okay? You know the tree I'm talking about. Don't go to that tree. We all know what happens. They go to the tree. Okay? And, and through that, death enters the world. Sin and death. Okay? We're all very familiar with that narrative, so I don't need to spend more time on that. As we fast forward, and this is talked about throughout both the, the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, that, that that is one metaphor for death and dying coming into the world. But you know what? Later in the Bible, we're introduced to a second Adam. A second Adam. We know this Adam by a different name in Scripture, but it's a second Adam. And that Adam lived a life just like all of us, died just like all of us will, but that Adam didn't stay dead. That Adam was raised from the dead. You know that Adam by the name Jesus. It wasn't long ago that we gathered here together to celebrate Easter and we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. And, and that's a beautiful, powerful thing. And that's worth placing faith in. But a lot of times, we who believe in resurrection don't spend enough time thinking about the fact that resurrection isn't just about Jesus. Resurrection is about all of us. All of us. We live an eternal existence. When Jesus first came and, and he started speaking to the people, he said, repent, change your lives, reorganize your lives. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. And he wasn't saying, get ready, because something is about to happen sometime soon. He said, the kingdom is at hand. It's right here. It's now. Okay? Resurrection is ours now. We don't live an eternal life. We, we, you know, we, we think about uh, John 3.16, and, and God's only begotten Son came into the world so that we could have everlasting life. Eternal life doesn't start after you die. It's now. It is in the here and now. It is a present reality. And so physical death is not something to be afraid of. Physical death, in that sense, becomes nothing more than a transition from one way of experiencing eternal life to a different way of experiencing eternal life. I'm going to close with a, a quote from one of my favorite philosophers. He's a 
a guy out of uh, Northern Ireland named Peter Rollins, and and he really sums things up in a beautiful way. He says, everlasting life for me is not a theological question. It's a scientific, a medical question. The theological question is, is life possible before we die? Is it possible to live in life? Is it possible to experience a depth and a density to life? That, for me, is a question of faith. If you can't experience a depth and a density of life, then everlasting life wouldn't be a blessing. It would be a curse. I don't simply want to have longevity. I want to have depth. Living eternal in the here and now gives us access to that. That's what the Jesus thing is all about for us. Okay? And I'm not about to get evangelistic on you and do an altar call and, and all of that stuff. But, but that's the powerful, compelling message of Jesus, that we live eternal life now. I don't have to wait. Death may still be uncomfortable for us. But if we live into the reality of resurrection, it's all going to be okay. It's all okay. And, and we can look at death for what it is. We don't have to fear it. And instead of saying at the close of our time together, go be Jesus, I'm going to tell you instead, go be eternal. Let's pray. God, we do acknowledge the, the death and dying. It's, it's hard stuff. It's uncomfortable for us. But we also acknowledge the gift of it, the gift to become the people we always wanted to be. So we thank you for the opportunity before us today. And we thank you for the gift of eternal life in the here and the now. Help us to reflect on that, be available to it, be available to the challenge that it brings. Thank you for being here with us, for loving us, for giving us a good gift of life. Amen.